Good morning. A warm welcome to Newcombe Up Parish Church. Well, we know winter's creeping in because that's strictly started. Intimations are on your intimation sheet. Um, can I just extend thanks to everyone who came to the Songs of Praise on Tuesday afternoon for Guild Week. It was a great afternoon sharing fellowship together. And also, um, thanks to those who organised the trip on Wednesday to Aaron. Apparently, everybody really enjoyed their time together. And it was a new place for a few people there also. Intimations, um, the quiet time um, with the Reverend Ken will start again on Thursday. So from 11am until 12, you can come for a quiet time and a prayer here in the church. And I would just encourage you to read all the other intimations this morning. Good morning, everyone. Let us worship God. Let us now all sing to God's praise our first hymn, Praise to the Lord.
Jesus said, Be careful not to make a show of your religion before people, because if you do, no reward awaits you in your Father's house in heaven. And if you greet your brothers and sisters, what is there extraordinary about that? Even the heathen do as much. You must therefore be all goodness, just as your heavenly Father is all good. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, the source from whom we come and the end to whom we travel, help us to worship you today with reverence and with sincerity. Quieten our restless minds, strengthen our uncertain faith, stir our sleeping consciences. O Lord, our King, you have been given our lives with their richness of opportunity and their wealth of interest. But too often we've wasted and misused them. We complain and grumble, forgetting about what others endure cheerfully. We're hard on our neighbors and generous to ourselves. We keep wearing the blinkers of prejudice because the light of truth hurts us. We can be boastful and conceited rude and selfish, quick to take offense, so sure that we are right and that others are wrong. Lord Jesus, the real light of the world, show us what we are like and make us truly sorry. And may God grant to all who are penitent the assurance that their sins are forgiven and the blessing of his peace. Almighty God, without whom we are weak and helpless, be with us in our daily lives. We pray for faith, for faith in the creative love by whom the world was made, for faith in the divine purpose and action shown to us in Jesus, for faith in his church, which the forces of death shall never overpower. Lord, give us faith. And we pray for hope, for hope that good will triumph over evil, truth over falsehood, beauty over ugliness, for hope that people will never think themselves too strong to depend on God, for hope that our present trials are the birth pangs of a new and a better order. Lord, give us hope. And we pray for love, for the love which is very patient, very kind, for the love which delights in the truth, for the love which has no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. Lord, give us love. And hear us now as we pray together in the words of Jesus, our Lord, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Boys and girls, it's good to see you this morning in church. I think you'll agree with me that it's quite nice to have something that's new. You might be going to see a new place. You might be getting something new for your bedroom, a new picture or something for the wall or something for you to like. You might get a new toy, and that would be exciting. Well, a long time ago, Mr. York got something new. When I was leaving Dalmellington, and I was leaving the Sunday school there, the boys and girls got me something new. It's not new now because I have used it a lot, but it came in this box, and I opened it, and then I opened the box, and just look what was inside. Now this is called a harmonica, or some people call it a mouth organ. 
There's lots of little holes there. See that? And when you blow in the holes, it makes a noise. It makes a noise. And when you blow to the left-hand side, these are low notes. When I blow to the right-hand side, these are high notes. Now, fortunately, I had been speaking in the church about the mouth organ, and maybe that's why the boys and girls got, got it for me. But when I was a little boy, when I was a little boy, somebody bought me a mouth organ at Christmas time. And I used to take it to bed every night. I kept it under my pillow. And I used to try to play it. And I discovered something. That when I blow, I get certain noises. But something else, when I suck, I get different noises. And then I worked out. I could play what musicians call a scale. That's a scale. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Some people call it. And once you have a scale, you can then play a tune. And my mum used to shout up to me, Kenneth! Put that away. It's time you were sleeping. I shouldn't be telling you this. I went under the quilt. I went under the quilt. Kenneth, I can still hear that. Stop. And I had to put it away under my pillow. But as I said to you, I could discover I could play a tune. And one easy tune was Three Blind Mice. Do you know that tune? There you are. Boys and girls, I only learned to play the mouth organ because I practiced. I practiced every day, and to my mum's annoyance, every night. And I learned that as a boy, and I've never forgotten it. It's like learning to ride your bicycle without stabilizers. When you can do it, you can always do it. And even if you stopped riding a bicycle for 20 years, you could go back in 20 years' time, I'm sure, and still ride a bicycle. I would like to think that everybody hopes that they could be a good person. I would like to think that everybody thinks that they could be a kind and caring person. Deep down, I think most people have that feeling. And that's one of the reasons why we come to church and to Sunday school, because we hear about somebody who was what some people call the perfect man. Jesus, a very, very good person loving, caring person. And we hear about Jesus in the Bible. And when we go to the Bible, the Bible tells us how we can be good and loving and caring. It also tells us, though, that when we do go wrong, and we all go wrong sometimes, everybody goes wrong sometimes, if we ask Jesus to forgive us and to help us to be better, that's what happens in the future if we really try to do it. If we try to follow Jesus and keep him at the center of our lives, he makes us better people. And he makes us happier people. I once knew a lady who really followed Jesus very, very well. She was a very, very good, kind, caring lady. And she came to church every Sunday. Every Sunday in life that she was fit, she came to church. And I know that she was like that because she loved Jesus and she tried to follow him. And that made her very happy. 
and something even better than happiness. It made her very content. Now, if you don't know what content means, you ask your mum or your dad or your gran when you go home, what does it mean to be content? It's a lovely thing because it means you're happy with the way you are and you're happy with your surroundings. I hope you can all come to that stage of being content. Now we're going to sing our next hymn, which is Let Us With A Gladsome Mind. Sorry, Let Us With A Gladsome Mind. Let us now all listen for the word of God. Our first reading is from Psalm 24, verses 1 to 6. Of David, a psalm. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God his Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 9, from 9 to 17. 
the calling of Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of a bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the past patch will plate pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wine skins be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. Amen. Our next hymn, I Serve a Risen Saviour.
Let us now focus our gaze on the great God of our making as we pour out to him our prayers for others. Let us pray. Lord of everyone, give your church such maturity and wisdom that we may not be swayed from our purpose and calling by trivialities or worldly pressures, but know increasingly our dependence on you in all things and pro proclaim your gospel with steadfastness and joy. You, O oh Lord, are the ground of our being. Lord of everyone, give to all monarchs, leaders, and heads of state graciousness and integrity, that all in power and authority may undertake their duties in a spirit of humility, that the oppressed may find a voice, and the nations work together for the good of the whole world. You, O Lord, are the ground of our being. Lord of all, give to our homes and places of work and leisure your harmony and your peace. Give us grace to respect one another and ourselves in the way we talk and think and in the way we behave. You, O oh Lord, are the ground of our being. Lord, we pray for our guild as they begin a new session of their work. We remember all guild members in Scotland seeking your blessing upon them in this coming session. And we pray especially this morning for our own guild and their leaders that your Holy Spirit might inspire them and encourage them to follow you and to remember whose they are and whom they serve. You, Lord, are the ground of our being. Lord of all, speak your peace into the hearts of all who are agitated, anxious, or confused. Lay your hands of healing on all who are ill, and let them know your reassurance and your love. As now we remember those known to us who are in need today. You, O oh Lord, are the ground of our being. Lord of all, welcome into your kingdom all who have kept faith and now can lay their burdens down. May they rest in your peace forever. You, O oh Lord, are the ground of our being. Lord of all, the order and the complexity of creation sings your praise, and we give voice to it now as we offer you our song of lives rededicated to the work of your kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The choir will now sing their anthem.
We now sing the hymn, God So Loved This Whole World. Well, the Guild has now come to the end of their Guild Week 2023, and they have chosen for their theme in this new session, New Wine, New Wineskins. Now, I'd like to say just a little about that today. Matthew, in the ninth chapter of his Gospel, which we heard read today, draws our attention to this. And this passage is a bit of a theological minefield. And I do not intend this morning to confuse by looking at all the different ideas and interpretations which theologians offer. But having studied this, I believe that fundamentally, the subject in the paragraph we read talks about the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We are used to thinking about the Old Testament, where we see the law of Moses established and we hear from the prophets. And then we are used to the New Testament, which speaks of a new time, a new covenant, which is brought about by the coming of Jesus into the world, by his life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus, God's Messiah, coming into the world to establish a new way, a new covenant. In the passage we listen to today, Matthew says that it was the disciples of John the Baptist who were asking why it was that they and the Pharisees fasted, but the disciples of Jesus did not. Jesus' reply tells them quite clearly that they are now living in a new age. 
the old age of strict obedience to the law has gone, and a new age of fulfilling the will of God under the direction and assistance of the Holy Spirit is now here. This new age is the time of the wedding, the time of a new relationship between God and his people. And while the person who has brought about that new age is still there at the wedding, they shouldn't mourn. They should be happy. They should be celebrate. They should celebrate. There would come a time for fasting and mourning, but that would be later on, after his death. Now we know that the Jews were passionate about their law. The trouble was that there was within Judaism more than one interpretation of the law. And this caused confusion amongst many Jews. Jesus was very aware of this. And he was also aware that he had come with new and fresh ideas and with a new conception of the truth. He knew fine how difficult it was going to be to get these new ideas into the minds of people. So he used two pictures which any Jew at that time would understand. The first was a picture of new cloth being used to repair a hole in an old garment. They all knew that if they tried to do this, it wouldn't work. Because when the new cloth got damp or wet, it would shrink and it would tear itself away and leave more damage to the garment than had been done in the beginning. Then he painted a picture of new wine being put into old wineskins. Now, wine was normally stored in skins in New Testament times. And Jesus reminded them, because they knew this, that no one would put new wine into old wineskins, because the new wine would continue to ferment, and the old wineskins would not be flexible enough to cope with the expansion. And the new wine and the old wineskins would both be lost. So new wine had to be put into new wineskins, which would be able to stretch and allow for expansion. Jesus was trying to draw their attention to the fact that the time of the old covenant had come to an end, and it was time for a new way forward, for a new covenant, which should be celebrated and not mourned. Now, it's important to recognize here that Jesus wasn't trying to do away with the old law. He said this himself, and he went on to say that he had come to fulfill it. Jesus was always able to see through the text of the law, to the reason for its existence, to its purpose, and its intended fulfillment. In his commentary on this passage, William Barclay, that great theologian of the last century says this, throughout all its history, the church has clung to the old. What Jesus is saying is that there comes a time when patching is folly, and when the only thing to do is to scrap something entirely and to begin again. There are forms of church government. There are forms of church service. There are forms of words expressing our beliefs, which we so often try to adjust and tinker with in order to bring them up to date. We try to patch them. Now, I know that no one would willingly or recklessly or callously abandon what has stood the test of time and of the years, and in which former generations have found their comfort and put their trust but the fact remains 
that this is a growing and an expanding universe. And there comes a time when patches are useless and when people and a church have to accept the adventure of the new or withdraw into the backwater where they worship not God, but the past. Does that not bring us all right into the situation we are in the church today? In Scotland, I know there is a sense in which our church has been forced into this situation for historical reasons where we have fallen heir to too many buildings by diminishing finances and human resources, having been unable to find a necessary number of people to offer themselves for the position of ministry of word and sacrament, then to find ourselves with insufficient income to pay all these people, even if we could find them. In addition, due to rising costs of repairing old buildings, which are often unsuitable in design and structure for modern ways of worship, which may now involve digital technology, and the realization that we have far too many buildings like that, we have at long last been forced to agree that we have to come to some painful decisions and to dispose of some of these buildings. The time for patching and trying to put new wine into old wineskins is surely over. We are trying to reform in the Church of Scotland under the banner of mission. My question is, have we gone far enough? We still have, at our heart, very expensive administration structures, although I suspect that many of those involved in these structures might not consider themselves that that is what they are. Also, existing congregations may now see themselves far more remote than before from their huge presbyteries, more than they ever did. Hopefully, our new way forward will evolve and will change and will be adapted and adjustments will continue to be made. However, what is really important in all this is that we continue on our process of change, keeping Jesus Christ at the center of all we do, and that we do that with excitement and with enthusiasm. No one of us likes change, but we must not allow this current process of change to discourage us in the faith. I know some members of the Church of Scotland who, when hearing that their church building was to be disposed of, have left the church and they've stopped worshipping. They don't worship anywhere. That kind of action surely begs the question, what were they really worshipping? After all, do we not worship and serve the one, Jesus Christ, who does not change? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he calls us to serve him in a changing world. And we must continue to be led forward, supported and encouraged by the Holy Spirit to find and work in ways that will spread the good news of Jesus in our modern God-rejecting society. We must therefore proceed through this time of change with Jesus at the center of all our thinking and our planning and our worshiping. New times for the church will inevitably necessitate new ways of working new ways of cooperation between congregations, new ways of worship using modern multimedia methods, 
to allow one minister, perhaps, to lead worship in more than one church building at the same time. I believe that the future is exciting. And I believe that if Jesus is kept at the center of it all, it will produce a rich harvest. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. And to his name be glory and praise. Amen. Your offering will now be received. Let us pray. Gracious God, we lift up our hearts today in thankfulness for all your goodness and all your grace. We thank you for your church, which calls us to service, that church in which we find friendship and fellowship and the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for all the organizations within our church, giving thanks especially today for the Guild, who down through the years have been of such service to your church and to you. Lord, we thank you for their presence among us. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for our families and our friends, for our homes and for the good standard of living that we all enjoy. That even in times of distress, in times of difficulty, they are there with us to support us. Lord, we thank you for their constant presence and their love. But most of all, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love which was offered to all people in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord who came to help us to have life, life in abundance. Lord, we thank you for his presence among us today and for the many ways in which he speaks to us and encourages us in the faith. And as a token of our love, we place upon this table these our gifts, praying that you will accept them and bless them, that they may be used for the purposes of love within this congregation, within our parish, and beyond. In Jesus' name we offer these our prayers. Amen. We now sing our closing hymn, When to our world the Saviour came.
Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you and with all those you love, today and always. Thank you.